Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot for the for the nice invitation. So I see the slides. Okay, so in the next ten minutes, I will uh, try to uh, tell you, I mean, uh, about which are the the potential, which is the potential role of the pathologist, and I will change probably the uh, our profession in the near future to understand this probably we should look a little bit uh, in the past. Uh, I can imagine that the life of the oncologist, it's an hard life. But for sure, I can tell you that the life of pathologist is quite hard. So uh, we, every day it's like that we, we walk on a rope and this is quite unstable. And uh, to make these things even more unstable, during the last 20 years, uh, we had several earthquakes uh, that we that changed deeply our profession. So the first one in the late 90s was the advent of the microarray technologies that apparently was seen as a way to uh, address the clinical heterogeneity problem that was not clearly possible uh, with the simple morphological and subjective evaluation of the pathologist. Then we had in uh, 2001 the complete sequencing of the human genome and uh, this uh, led to the start of the uh, genomic revolution that is still ongoing and uh, this actually completely changed our way to diagnose a tumor and had skills that we haven't before. In the, in the meantime, there was also the, uh, the description and the, the theory of the cancer stem cells. And uh, this, at that time, I was still in, in uh, finishing my residency. And uh, it really impacted me by the fact that uh, if this was really true and could have a clinical application, this would have made uh, a completely change in the way we evaluated the tumor. It was not to look for the majority of the cells expressing a biomarker, but was the opposite, looking for the few rare cells not expressing or expressing a specific biomarker. And last but not least, in 2014, there is the first publication about the, the use of liquid biopsy in the clinics. And this, of course, represents uh, the holy grail for the oncologist because it's the best way to go from the patients to the genomic lab without having the samples uh, going to the pathology lab. So, of course, I mean, the, you, you address uh, many problems at, at the same time. So, uh, I will uh, uh, discuss with few examples where I see uh, the main changes in our profession in the near future. So the first is going from glass to digital. So uh, as an example, I will take uh, the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte story. So we have heard about that uh, during all the Congress by Dr. Fatima Carneiro on Thursday in gastric cancer and yesterday in colorectal cancer. And uh, for sure, this identify a good prognosis uh, group of uh, tumors usually is associated with the MSI uh, genotype. And uh, uh, very recently, there are emerging data supporting the fact that uh, TILS can be also used to predict response to immunotherapy. So, but the problem is, if I ask to your pathologist, uh, if this is currently used uh, or reported in your uh, pathology report, and if so, how do they do this? How do they quantify this? They will probably not have a, a clear answer. There are no guidelines. There are no consensus. And uh, the only thing that we know is that this is worth doing. So, of course, the easiest way to do is using an h and &E glass-based assessment. It's semi-quantitative. You classify tumors in high TILs versus low TILs. And this has been shown to be quite reproducible and correlating with uh, prognosis in colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, and, uh, and other tumor type, of course. And uh, on the other side, there is the immunohistochemistry based digital quantification. This has been extensively validated by uh, Gallon with the immunoscore. 
and essentially evaluating two markers and analyzing these two markers, the invasive fronts and tumor center uh, by image analysis, he can uh, uh, demonstrate the uh, prognostic value even more than what the current TNM staging does in colorectal cancer. There have been a few studies bridging the, the, the two approach and uh, likely the result suggests that you can get highly concordant results using the semi-quantitative approach and the IHC-based approach. So, how to quantify TILS? Maybe today we can still use uh, a low-cost approach with the metoxin and eosin. But the next question is, when we have a biomarker to evaluate in TILS, there it's better that we go digital. In the, if we learn the story of PDL1 in, uh, in uh, lung cancer, uh, you know there are different antibodies, each one associated with a specific drug, and uh, you can evaluate this in the tumor, in the immunocell, and the immune component. And what the data are showing is that when you evaluate this in the tumor component, you get a very high uh, concordance rate between the observer, among the observers. But when you evaluate this in the inflammatory component, and this would be the case especially in uh, tumors like colorectal cancer where PDL1 is expressed essentially in the uh, immune component, the agreement rates is very, very, very poor. So this is supported here we need a height to evaluate a biomarker in, uh, in, in the immune component, where we are not used to do as, as so far the biomarker have been evaluated always in the tumor cells. From quantitative to dynamic range. So this is another aspect that I believe is going to be uh, really important in the future, so you know better than me the result of the TOGA study, the year 2 the study that led to approval the over twin uh, gastric cancer, that was the first targeted therapy. So uh, this study was positive in the entire study population, but also, but especially in those tumors that expressed high level over 2. And uh, what was disappointing was that the subsequent studies using other anti 2 inhibitors like lapatinib or TDM1 were negative. Were negative, but at a deeper analysis of the data, those tumors that expressed high level of VER2 with immunohistochemistry 3 plus, or those tumors with high level of amplification responded to uh, the anti 2 treatment. So, this data suggested that maybe quantification more than simple qualitative analysis could be a better predictor of response to the drug. So for this we have to learn maybe from breast cancer. You know that the criteria to evaluate R2 in breast cancer have been changed uh, when applied to, uh, to gastric cancer. This is because there are differences in membrane staining pattern. There is a high level of heterogeneity in gastric cancer compared to breast cancer. That led also to different scoring criteria in biopsies versus uh, surgical specimens. So essentially, if you are not familiar with the scoring, a tumor 3 plus positive means that 10%, at least of 10% of cells are positive. But if we take into account what has been described in terms of heterogeneity in, in breast cancer, gastric cancer, in breast cancer, it's very likely that a 10% will reflect more than 10% of cell positive. In gastric cancer, this 10% probably is the only clone positive for R2. So let's forget for a second immunohistochemistry and let's think to an approach like genomic, for example, where you take the entire sample you forget about the localization, the heterogeneity, the membrane staining pattern, and you quantify these samples. We did this in, in breast cancer, and what we saw is that the dynamic range in the uh, three plus, that is what we consider positive and homogeneously positive, is quite high. It can vary of 10, uh, of 100 fold, in a 100 fold range. And, uh, when we look for a cutoff that correlated with immunohistochemistry, we found this at 740 optimal microgram, but this cutoff was not predictive of clinical benefit. You had to go with a higher level to find a cutoff that was predictive of immunohistochemistry. So if we go to gastric cancer, one year after there was a study using the same technologies, mass spectrometry, uh, analyzing 237 breast cancer samples, 
including sample from the DOGA study, and found very similar data to what we see in breast cancer. So essentially, the cutoff is the same that correlated with immunohistochemistry, and the cutoff that correlated with clinical benefit is different, and it's uh, associated with higher level over two. So essentially, what this means, that the two tumors are not so different. What is different is the, the heterogeneity can be taken into account by using a very quantitative method. So what we need is really to quantify the level over two. So uh, essentially, the next point is that where I see that will be a big change will be shifting from single to multiplex biomarkers. So the traditional approach in pathology is one marker at a time. This is easy to evaluate, but of course, will use a lot of samples. And uh, you cannot multiplex multiple biomarkers at the same time. The uh, approach that is currently used is an immunofluorescence approach. You can combine up to five biomarkers. But on the uh, back side, it's very difficult to evaluate in a routine clinical setting, and you are limited to the number of fluorochrome available. What I foresee, and this is starting to emerge, it's what I call as a next generation immunohistochemistry, where one single section can be currently used to stain N number of biomarkers without affecting the quality of the tissue. This is done and achieved by uh, sequential cycles of stain, scan, and uh, stripping of the antibody. And this would allow not only, uh, this not only have all the pro of the traditional immunofluorescence approach, but uh, at least I was not able to find any cons in, uh, in, in this technology. And the application, of course, are uh, immense, and the potential use of these technologies has been described in a recent publication in Cancer in uh, Cell Reports that I would suggest and re would, rec would recommend to read. So then from tissue to liquid, we have discussed a lot about liquid bio biopsy in gastrointestinal cancer. There is no doubt that this has a future. So what I will not go discuss now is the positive side. I will discuss a, bit, a little bit about the challenge. So the detection of circulating tumor DNA depends on of the abundance of the cDNA in the blood. So th this is highly variable. It depends on the stage of the tumor and, and so of, of the tumor burden. The sensitivity is highly affected by the method used and the sequence in depth and the number of the future interrogated. What is very clear is that the approach is highly specific but its sensitivity uh, across all the different study performance is about of 50%. And this has to be taken into consideration. In addition, to increase the sensitivity, the risk is that you detect age-related somatic mutations that are not pathogenic. This last represents false positive results. And last but not least, uh, Currently, this requires a prior knowledge of the mutation status of the tumor determining the tissue. So you need the tissue. This is just to compare the three different approaches and specimen types, and simply uh, to apply this in the, clinic, in the clinical practice, if you don't want to use the tissue and you prefer to shift to uh, circulating uh, to liquid biopsy, please consider that the same patient, according to you do the analysis in the tissue or uh, the circulating tumor DNA, can provide a different kind of result. And the concordance between the, 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 the mutation detected in the blood versus the one detected in the tissue can be very different. And the last but not least, to get actual genomic mutation to be translated in the clinical, there are several challenges to overcome, and the partnership with your pathologist may be a good strategy to make sure you increase the number of approvals that are targeted in the clinic. So uh, essentially, where I can see the next challenge for pathologists, maybe uh, according to a recent publication, this will be pigeons. In, uh, maybe not in 2020, but already now, there is, was a nice publication in PLOS One where pigeons, or Columba Libia, were used as a trainable observer not only for pathology slides, but also for uh, uh, radiology breast cancer images. So also the radiologist colleagues need to be uh, careful about these new, these new people coming into the... 
into the lab. And uh, let me conclude uh, uh, with a, with a uh, sentence that was written in uh, 1938 about the future of pathology. And the sentence says, the future of pathology as a whole will be chiefly affected by the ability of all kinds of pathologists to adapt their specialty to e the ever-changing aspect of medical problems. This was written in 1938, but I think it's a, uh, very actual today. Thank you very much.